George Norrie back in a moment on Coast to Coast AM. And welcome back to Coast to Coast. I'm George Norrie with our guest Clifford Carnicom. We're going to take your calls later on tonight, so get ready for that. Cliff, uh, let's talk also as we get into these seven major aspects of what you think they might be. Tell me about the evidence behind it. How did you come to your beliefs that these issues were caused by these particular seven items we talked about earlier? Well, the first thing that I would uh, want to clarify, George, is is that I by no means uh, regard this work um, of myself as well as countless others as a belief system. And, and that's not meant as any kind of, of slight. It's simply meant as clarification. Uh, a belief system, you know, is based upon something that we, we can't observe, um, but we might feel mm-hmm. or think about something. Uh, this is not a belief system uh, that is being spoken of here. Uh, this is a, a physical transformation of our planet um, using visible, observable, uh, physical mechanisms. And, and so this is real. Okay. Is what I is what I wish to say from from my perspective. This is our reality um, that we are now subject to, and it is up to us to choose how we are going to deal uh, with this reality. But our, our planet has been altered in terms of you know my background and, and how I'm involved in this. My, you know my background is in in the technical sciences. Uh, I was a, a geophysical um, scientist. I've spent a great deal of my time in the outside world. I was also a surveyor, um, you know, and their their skill is one of measurement. Uh, and certainly these are some of the um, uh, skills and traits that I have brought to bear simply because that happens to be my aptitude. Uh, others will choose what is in their uh, forte, but m- my background is one of, of ob- observation, uh, analysis, assessment, uh, research, I'm a, a computer consultant at this point, so I often am, am thinking in terms of uh, system analysis and, and, and certainly uh, uh, logic, as well as many things that are certainly not linear in this world, and I'm very much aware of that. So, you know, that's how I approach this, is that is as an independent researcher, is, that it is as a citizen uh, acting in the public interest uh, to call attention to what I regard, and many others regard, as a criminal act, upon the inhabitants of this planet by physically and deliberately altering the very air that we breathe without our consent. And, and, and it, from my perspective, it certainly has nothing to do with, really, personally, I, I'm not attached to it uh, in terms of uh, the emotional response. Uh, certainly we have on that one. Right. I feel very strongly about this from an ethical and moral standpoint. But the work that I present is done primarily uh, of that as an observer, a recorder, an analyst, um, and a researcher. Have we found samples uh, that have been tested? Has I, anybody? I have spent a, a great deal of my time uh, conducting environmental samples. Um, why did I do that? Because when this was brought to the attention of so-called authorities, when this was brought to the attention of environmental aid agencies, when this was brought to the attention of any um, government official, the issue was dismissed, the issue was ridiculed, the issue was attempted to be marginalized. When an investigation was called for, you know, go back in the records and we will see what happened. That was another part of my job, was to document the record of public activism requesting an investigation on this issue. That's all they wanted. They mm-hmm. saw what was happening. They said, do your job. Tell us what's happening. They were slammed back with either no response at all or one of ridicule or denial. And the common response is everything's normal. What are you worried about? Clifford, what are your samples showing? In my case, there would be about uh, three or four main components. The first would be the metallic salts just seems to be across the board, and it's a curious class of metallic salts. It's not just any salt. Um, if you look at the periodic table, there's uh, in groups one and two, there are, certain, there are elements there that are rather unique in their properties. And is there electromagnetic properties that are especially interesting? Uh, salts such as uh, salts made of uh, barium, uh, potassium, uh, calcium, uh, magnesium. Uh, these salts have a very interesting and unusual physical quality to them, and that is that they are subject 
to ionization with fairly low levels of energy, especially the energy that is inherent in sunlight alone. That's a remarkable physical quality that has tremendous and huge implications for the interpretation of what is likely going on uh, with the introduction of these materials. So metallic salts are one dominant component, and if you look at my work, I'll go ahead and clarify this at this point. If somebody looks at my work, you will see a uh, detection of or evidence and reports presented okay. of unusual levels of, of calcium, magnesium, barium, and barium and potassium with a special emphasis upon barium. I have probably written two dozen papers on the barium issue. That is an extremely important element because of its toxicity. That is not a friendly element to our system in a, in a soluble form. A, another component would be that of a, uh, a fiber. There is a filament uh, that has repeatedly appeared. It is also most remarkable and unusual uh, because of its properties. These filaments or fibers are submicron in size. To appreciate the scale, we mentioned submicron before, to, to appreciate the sense of scale, uh, a human hair is roughly 60 to 100 microns uh, thick. Um, and asbestos fiber is a couple of microns. Uh, bacteria would be on the order of, oh, I'll call it 1 to 10 microns, and, and virus would be a submicron, this type of thing, somewhere in there. We're speaking of a submicron filament. Now, asbestos fibers are 2 microns in thick. Mm -hmm. Do most of us recall the attention given in this country to the environmental issues posed by the existence of asbestos in our environment? Huge. Many of us recall that. Okay. Would it not seem logical that if you had the repeated detection and presence uh, presented, this is not, you know, this is not something that somebody is conjecturing. These samples exist. These samples have been delivered by certified mail to the administrator of the United States Environmental Protection Agency requesting straightforward identification on behalf of the public welfare. And we don't get that, do we? We do not get that. As a matter of fact, the Environmental Protection Agency did not even acknowledge the physical existence of this sample. Let me ask you one quick question about these fibers, Cliff. Every once in a while, I'll wake up, I'll go outside, and I'll see what is not spider webs, but they sure look like them, and they're all over the place. Is that what these might be? Most likely. I'll, I'll never try to make an assessment until I see the actual material, but certainly these are the characteristics. In fact, this is a common claim that was made. You know, I'm, I'm familiar with most of the counterarguments that are made. I actually consider the counterarguments quite carefully and dig into them, and the counterargument here is, hey, folks, these are just spider webs. What the heck are you concerned about? It doesn't fit. If you look at the data, it doesn't fit. Okay, I've measured the spider webs. I've run considerable tests on spider webs chemically. They do not fit. And it's a different pattern. Well, spider webs have different patterns than, than what I webs, see. Spider webs, you know, are a seasonal phenomenon. Uh, you know, that do not occur in clumps. You know, a quarter inch thick um, that you can deliver in a letter. Um, you know, to the EPA and have them refuse. All right, and here's another question on these fibers, because this is really incredible. There are a lot of people in this country, Clifford, who are complaining of a disease, and they're not getting the attention that they should. And it's called Morgellons disease, and it includes some kind of little fibers that seem to be sticking out of their skin. They can feel it. It feels like there's an insect under their skin, creeping and crawling around. But there are little tiny fibers there. Maybe? What do you think? I, I am familiar with um, that illness to some degree. Um, I first came, became aware of several years ago, and I made my first reference to that in, in my work. What can, at this point, there is no direct linkage that I am aware of uh, between um, the filaments that are airborne that have been uh, presented to the EPA and the fibers that are inherent in, in the bodies of, of many people now, increasingly a uh, number of people. That does not mean there's not a connection by any means. In fact, the sensible thing to do is to see whether or not there is a connection. Right. Because there are many, many interesting parallels that take place. Well, and right now, mainstream medicine is denying it even exists. Sure, they call the people delusional. In fact, this is... This is one of the traits. There's three main things that are similar in this. Uh, you know, the first is that 
the issue of Mergellans, as well as that of the aerosols, there has been a very systematic, large-scale attempt to marginalize the issue and control the flow of information on it. 